again, thank the thank thank the museum for for making this possible. Um, History has always been really special to me uh, and my wife, so we're always willing to to do what we can to help support the the, the museum in Valdez. Um, they have a great staff. They've always been really helpful to us, and um, we really appreciate them. Um, secondly, I just want to express my my deepest sympathies to the community of Valdez for the recent loss of Mr. McAlpine. Uh, I know that hits hard and. And um, I just wanted to express my condolences to the community and and those people who know who knew him and and, and what he accomplished when he was on the earth. Um, I just want to acknowledge that before I get started. Um, so I'm not going to go in real in depth on 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 alpinism and Valdez and this microscope because that, that could take a lot of time developing all the pictures, specific routes, what was done first, what was done second, who did what, when, and, and all that timing. But I wanted to make it a little bit more broader because my context is from um, a resident of Valdez who, who actually lived here uh, with these gentlemen um, that I'm gonna be talking about in Valdez. Uh, during this short period of time um, in, in Valdez, uh, prior to, prior to 1985, so it's just a very short snapshot um, of that time. So in in 2010, I went to the the Valdez uh, Consortium Museum or Consortium Library, and I gleaned every copy of the Valdez Vanguard uh, from 1977 to 1985, uh, focusing on a variety of of topics, including alpinism. Uh, the newspaper went out of business and the paper's not available on microfish. So when an article popped up, I simply took a picture of it. Um, the Vanguard had a great staff of writers who relished covering the events and people uh, surrounding the growth of modern alpinism in Valdez. Uh, these new climbers came from the, from the East Coast, Colorado, and even Nebraska. And while they lived their lives to the fullest in the mountains, some had other challenges in their lives, such as living in Valdez and, and raising families here. Um, while many know of these individuals, a few of us lived with them for decades in a small town in, in remote Alaska that was pretty much undiscovered. But it really wasn't undiscovered because we have the records of miners and, and riggers throughout the range, uh, all, all throughout the, the gold rush and, and copper era. Um, hiking all over the mountains around here. And perhaps the most, you know, the first really significant reference to mountaineering um, would be Bradford Washburn establishing his, his, his first Photoshop in Valdez and taking some of the first uh, aerials of, of, of Alaska, uh, leaving the mud flats. And of course he went on to uh, Mount Luciana adventure and a lot of people, you, you can research that, that's there. Um, so he was kind of, kind of a significant first gentleman that, that showed up in Valdez. And then after that, it was kind of a void till, till the 1950s when you had uh, USGS uh, geophysical year in 1956. Uh, came in and did a lot of surveying, a lot of expeditions, both private and, and government people uh, uh, covering the, the mountains uh, between Anchorage and Valdez. Um, and then there's another drop off. And then in 1964, Sir Edmund Hillary came to Valdez and was here the, the summer before the earthquake and, and spent three months in Valdez. And I, I don't have any records of, of, of what he did or what he might have done um, while he was in Valdez. I know he spent considerable time camping up at Blueberry Campground. So it was kind of eye candy for him. So it'd be interesting to to see someone research what, what, what he did during his time in Valdez. And then after that, we have a, a Ben Holman entered the area and did some exploration. And uh, those 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 trips are in American Alpine Journal. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into that. So I wanted to, to move to what I classify as the modern birth, the, the birth of modern uh, alpinism Valdez. And um, I, I think it started when, when Gore-Tex was was made available commercially, but uh, seriously, um, 
though Andrew Inbeck and Wyland arrived in the late 70s, and by 1980, uh, Chuck Comstock, I'm sure I get my slideshow moving here. Chuck Comstock was a, uh, and Brian Teal in 1984. Um, Scott Etherington was a constant partner of, of Wyland from the day he got to Valdez and during this time. And But I have little information on Scott. I knew him, but um, everything I've scanned, I can't find any pictures. I can't find any any mention of him in any the articles, unless they're contained in the American Alpine Journal. And other Valdez, Valdezans at this point of this period also included uh, Bob Shelton, Chris Larson, Pat Levy, Bob Pekka, um, Kathy Todd. Um, there, were, there, were, there, there were also a lot of Alaskans that came to Valdez and I, I, but I want, I'm going to concentrate on, 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 on these locals here. And I, I think um, all those people that were coming to Valdez to visit from, from Anchorage and Fairbanks, we know who they are. They all came here and, and joined the, joined the party. Um, I knew Chuck Comstock well. Uh, we served in the Coast Guard together and had a few adventures. Comstock arrived as a Coast Guardsman with no previous mountain skills, but quickly became obsessed with the sport. There were a number of Coast Guard personnel dabbling with climbing at the time. Um, Comstock took me to Embex's house for a slideshow my first winter. Um, his Embex two-story home was packed with people crashing in his basement for the night or longer. Um, while in the Coast Guard, Comstock volunteered hundreds of hours at the Valdez Museum, helping Tom McAllister restore the fire engine that now sits in the museum. <clears throat> he also qualified as a volunteer fireman, along with Dan, Dan Gildersleeve, another uh, Coastie who was also involved, involved in the climbing scenes. Uh, Chuck was short and stocky with stumpy fingers. Uh, he later became smothered in dirty yellow dreadlocks and wore sheep herder clothes. He snarled when he was happy or upset. He could be found often at the boulder problem at Dock Point or at the rock quarry with Teal near the Valdez Glacier. He read 1960s comic books, but only read the classics as an option. He always lived in in a construction zone, it seemed, and sometimes the back of his truck. Uh, this picture is in the Alaska range uh, with Brian Teal. Um, after the Coast Guard, he headed to the University of Fairbanks, returning frequently to Valdez and staying at Dr. Andrew Imbeck's house, exchanging lodging for his carpenter skills. He quit college and returned to Valdez. And like John Wyland and Brian Teal, he would become a carpenter. Comstock struggled with, with poor diet, drug abuse, and diabetes. His friends pleaded with him to get it together. Uh, Valdez treated Comstock like he was born there, a legend, and he got along with everyone and got away with a lot. <laughs> After a near fatal parasail accident above 10 mile in the late 1990s, he never recovered to climb again and passed away at an early age in Valdez in 2000 from various health complications. Just an anecdotal story to Chuck. When I went through Brian Teal's files, I was working with Brian this day. I think it was July 4th and um, Chuck climbed Town Mountain and jumped off it with his parasail with a boom box tied to his leg with um, I've Got a Dream by Martin Luther King. And he landed in the park strip and the kids swarmed all around him. So Chuck had a big heart. He was a really good guy. Um, I think we all know about his climbing accomplishments. This is just a, a perspective of the scene at the time, time with Chuck. Ice climbing. Uh, this is the earliest reference I could find to ice climbing in Valdez. Um, 
and uh, the the Val the Valdez Vanguard started doing a lot a lot of coverage. And uh, so this is just an example, one of the pictures that I took to add to, add to the files to to the Vanguard files. Uh, Embeck arrived in Valdez with exceptional climbing ski skills before touching any of its virgin, virgin ice. Um, there's plenty out there on, on his accomplishments. I knew Embeck and his wife, um, Kathy Todd, mostly from their efforts establishing cross-country skiing in Valdez. Uh, this, this is Andy's announcement for coming to Valdez. And um, he didn't waste any time um this this is an example of the writing that's available in the vanguard that this is andy and valdez the, the first year here he, he's here he's off to the kachat and spires doing doing uh premier routes in the alaska range so um again these these climbs are documented and uh but the perspective uh the vanguard actually took the time to interview him and get do an in-depth interview him about his trip is is fairly significant um another story i'll add about andy is um there's a nice picture i picked up of kathy out of the newspaper um yeah so andy was very busy and uh he was involved in everything anything that got people outdoors that was his focus was to get people out of their houses and outdoors whether it was ice climbing skiing uh, kayaking, triathlons, bike races. He offered everything he could to Valdez to, to get people outside and, 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 and have a healthy lifestyle. Um, one story I have about Embeck was, was kind of unusual conversation when it comes to alpinism is I had with him about documenting the first ascents of, of the recent peaks. And um, he laughed and said they weren't they weren't worthy of climbing. And so Andy had a little bit of an attitude when it came, came to the local, local peaks. And, uh, uh, you know, he was the head of the Alpine club. So we kind of wanted him to log the climbs, you know, cause he's chain of command and stuff, but, but a Andy kind of kept blowing, kept blowing us off, but, but it, it didn't distract us from, from climbing at all. Um, You know, he did he did like distance hiking later on and and submitted a number of trail articles in the 90s about routes in the Tikal Valley. And um, again, um, if you want to know more about Andy and, and that time of the day, it's all, all well documented um, in the Vanguard files that that the uh, that I've given to the um, to the to the museum. Okay. Andy was the. Alaska chapter representative to the American Alpine Club and just a, a member of the American Club, uh, the Alpine Club of London. Um, so, um, you know, he was very significant uh, in Alpine culture, not only in, in Valdez, but, but actually worldwide. He's a very, very significant figure. Uh, he worked at the Valdez Medical Clinic on rotating shifts and the community hospital with Todd while raising two daughters. Uh, the clinic's walls were graced and probably still are with pictures of, of his climbs. He volunteered extensively during this, these early years, um, helping train the fire department. Uh, he also initiated a training program for, for river and high angle rescue, knowing that these type of rescues would be needed in the future as outdoor sports grew around Valdez. Uh, with, okay. Yeah, let me just organize my notes here a little bit. Uh, Dr. Embech uh, tragically died from a self-infected gunshot wound while ca kayaking just a short distance from Dock Point. Um, I'm not sure when I met John Wyland, um, but during this period of time, you know, off the side of the ice climbing, which, which there's just tons of pictures. When I look at ice climbing pictures, I just, there's just so many of them. And especially in the teal files, it's really hard to, to get selective, but, uh, you know, we continued to push the limit. This is uh, 
summit day, first summit day on Sugarloaf, I believe. Um, here's Brian Teal on the top of Mount Benet, probably 84, 85. Um, really nice shot. I think he did that with John Wyland. And I discovered this picture going through his through his uh, through his slides when I was scanning his slides. Uh, I was kind of amazed at that, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, Tones Temple up on Thompson Pass, uh, just shy of uh, Sapphire Peak on a summer day. This is probably 1981, 1982. Pretty benign climb, but you know, it took glacier travel and ropes and all that stuff to get across the glacier. Um, here's from the first winter ascent of um, Sugarloaf Mountain, party of three of us looking down on the port. You know, Sugarloaf's kind of interesting because it's, you know, other than being a very dominant peak that everybody wants to go get on top of, I, I just want to lend a little credence because there has been, I have heard anecdotal reports of, you know, teenagers of Old Town, you know, climbing, climbing Sugarloaf Mountain. So, uh, and I don't know if those stories are still out there, but it'd be nice to hear about them. But yeah, yeah, beautiful day on Valdez. We went up the, the uh, east face. Um, I don't think anybody would do that these days. There's easier ways. Again, this is from the top of Mount Francis across the bay. First ascent with, with, um, Chris Larson and Bob Shelton. This is a day trip. So the Peak of Wheat Club was pretty lively, and our motivator was John Wyland. And I'm not sure when I met John Wyland. Um, he attempted to introduce me to ice climbing, but that failed. But I was all into backcountry skiing and joined him on two expeditions into the Chugach in the early 80s. And those trips are documented in the Vanguard files at the museum. Um, they all, all those files have the photos from that trip. Um, Wyland, like Embeck, arrived in 1978 with technical climbing experience. And of course, met, met Embeck for the first time. Uh, Wyland's primary partner for climbs was, was Scott Etherington. Um, over the next decade, uh, Wyland reached above the, the valley ice and pursued the unclimbed peaks around Valdez and surrounding Chugach. Um, just go back to this picture here. Uh, one thing John John introduced to the, uh, the concept of expedition skiing and it had been done before was he, he really wanted to make the dogs work. And uh, this was a real test of it on, on Chaplina. He had, he rigged up uh, crevasse rescue systems for the, law, for the dogs, three of us on a rope with two dogs um, it was pretty complicated, but John figured it out and uh, how to make it work, including having the sleds tethered. So we had three people on a rope, all dragging sleds, all hooked into dogs on a rope, hoping none of us fell in a crevasse because it would have been a spaghetti party, I think. But uh, but uh, John John was really committed to using the dogs. And I think that's kind of a where we kind of combine that with the alpinism on this trip of. Uh, of Mount Chaplina trip. Um, over the next decade, uh, he crossed the Chugas from the sea near Cordova in 1979. A uh, group of Valdezians skied to Cordova. And of course that took, took, took some skill and some time to do that. Uh, John led that trip. And I don't think anybody on that trip really, really had uh, much in the way of technical uh, rope experience or anything like that. But John tied him up and took him. Um, he also opened the first guiding service in Valdez. Um, and uh, he, he was a mentor to many residents new to Valdez in the sport of ice climbing, um, including the first, first ascent of Green Steps, I believe, with, with, with Mr. Lowe. So, um, and, and that's documented. I'm not going to go, I want to kind of, stay on track here. And John arrived with expert ski skills and became the first manager, just on the side, became the first manager for the rope tow at Salmonberry Skill, which I understand is still running. And most of the people involved in that were, were, were from the Alpine community, including myself and Brian Teal, 
were out there clearing brush and trying to trying to get kids outside, get them skiing, getting them into the you're trying to develop a mountain culture in Valdez uh, on the side of these guys doing this Valtine, Alpine stuff. They were really dedicated to the community at, uh, at other levels. Um, John led a group of Valdezians success, successfully to the summit of Denali via Wonder Lake and the Pioneer Ridge. In fact, he, he repeated that route again. And as a side note, his dad climbed Denali in 1971 at the age of 50, at the age of 50. And uh, John still lives in Alaska near Palmer. Another picture of John. This is uh, on the Chugas Traverse from Eureka Lodge to Valdez. That's the Hummingbird Ridge on um, Audubon Peak. And uh, they didn't make it. Uh, they tried to go up the ridge, and then they had a crevasse incident and kind of bagged it for the day. The next day, we took off and continued skiing to Valdez. Uh, same time, Father Mike Shields and I went across the glacier and made an attempt on Brontosaurus Peak and maybe 400 feet shy in a blizzard. So we bailed on that. Um, Brian Teal, I'm going to add a few extra slides in here because I think there's a lot of people that know Brian. And uh, both Brian and he arrived with a resume from Colorado that was under the radar, having climbed with luminaries of the of the 70s that divined uh, that regions of Colorado's climbing history. Uh, the number of people he had contact with when he was a teenager is kind of extraordinary. And I, I just can't imagine the influence. But when I look at Brian, uh, you know, he was carrying a backpack at 14 years old and somebody in peaks at 16 in Colorado. And so he he was all in right away from a young man. And and um, he came to Valdez and made his home here, home there. Um, I recall visiting the Black Canyons and seeing his log entries um, of his trip to the Black Canyon. Um, Here's Brian at a real tender age, backpacking in Colorado for the first time. He's the guy with the blue shirt on and the black hair, of course, in the middle. <clears throat> and so he progresses through his life and that eventually brings him, brings him to Valdez. Um, Teal was a small contractor for carpentry and painting. Uh, during the winter, he switched gears and provided snow removal with his bobcat plows. When he got caught up, he always headed for the ice or the slopes. Um, not sure what peak in Colorado this is from. I should add, it's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, but him and Dan Morrison, who lives in Dan Morrison, who's, who lives uh, near McCarthy, uh, grew up with Brian, climbing with Brian, and thought they both came to Alaska together um, after doing some pretty, I think this is the top of Mount Robson. Yeah, top of Mount Robson. And then um, uh, they did quite a bit of stuff, and and they eventually, as they moved their way north through the through the Colorado Rockies on trips, uh, eventually they, but they both filtered down into Valdez about, about 1983. Um, here's another picture of Brian. Um, he cycled to uh, from Colorado to the to the Rockies. Make sure I'm up on my notes here. This I found this in Brian Pictures file. This is his first trip to Valdez, and uh, I remember that truck. And that's him and Dan Morrison, uh, the first winter they had val arrived in Valdez. So. Um, yeah, it's interesting that he ended up living there so long after a road trip there. Must have, must have really liked the place. So you can imagine Brian driving through Keystone Canyon for the first time. Yeah, I think I'll stick around for a while. Uh, both Peel and Embeck were all in on kayaking. Uh, they pioneered Keystone Canyon, the Sena, and other rivers throughout Alaska. Um, he was a master at climbing, ice, rock, rafting, and Nordic skiing. 
After I moved from Alaska in 2018, we kept in touch. Brian continued finding a wealth of new ice along the steep walls of the, of, of the, of the Valdez Glacier, opening up a new zone with other locos, perhaps the best ever opened in Valdez. There's a picture of Brian I find kind of funny, the, you know, the <laughs> canoeing across the river. I have another picture where there's, they got ropes going across the river and some, somebody pulling themselves across, but, but uh, Brian was all into whatever it took. It was just another adventure to, to add to getting across the low river uh, to get to the ice. But uh, yeah, I just found this is just kind of a reflection of alpinism at the time. Um, Brian's life was impacted by, by near and real tragedies. Uh, he sur we survived an avalanche together. Um, he survived being crushed along with Wyland when an ice, ice pillar broke. Uh, this story and his recovery are in the Vanguard files. Uh, soon not, one of his favorite partners disappeared in the Alaska range with another climber in 2006. I know he was deeply hurt by that. In 2018, while climbing ice above the Valdez Glacier, his partner, Haley Ann Redman, fell, fell to her death. Um, but he overcame these challenges and kept climbing at a high level till his death at 65 in 2022 in a workplace accident. So while there's certainly some sadness to the lives of these individuals, it's important to look beyond their incredible mountaineering accomplishments and, and look at their life in general and how they related to the community of Valdez. Um, you know, when they came here, like, like, like me and a lot of other people that might be here, uh, Alaska represented a, a big open open space to be able to go out and, and, and find places that people had never touched before. And, uh, you know, Valdez was the perfect opportunity for that at the right time in the right place. And that little span there from when Embeck arrived, when Gore-Tex became, and when Gore-Tex became available till about 1985, um, it was pretty amazing uh, the progression and watching the people come into Valdez, the the uh, the ice festival, how it took off, how that that generated generated this huge excitement, and um, we just had this constant drove of ice climbers coming into Valdez from from all over the state and all over the world for for a long time. Uh, some would come and you wouldn't even know they were there, and they would do great things and and disappear. But uh, that's that's kind of my um, presentation. It's a little different. It's kind of a broad overview of give you a better background on 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 who these people are. So so if we can go want to go ahead and open it up to uh, discussion, Faith, that would be fine. The faith is still there. I'm still here. Okay. She has some unmuting to do. Yeah. So um, you will, can now unmute yourselves. And if you have questions for Matt, um, you can verbalize those and you can also write them in the chat, whatever you'd like to do. Not another photo. Questions. Okay, Karen, can you speak up? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Yeah, speak up. Oh, um, yeah. okay. Yeah, I didn't quite have a question yet, but um, thank you for putting together the the whole talk and and all the photos. We're just stuffing our face here at the table with moose stew and ice cream. Um, wish you were here, Matt. Um, I'll have a bowl of ice cream with you later. Thank you. Hi, Matthew. Hello. Matt, um, Jack Attack asked, um, he joined late, did I miss anything about Chuck Comstock or Roman Dial? Um, you know, I did. I, I didn't include 
Roman dial in, in, in this discussion, but I, I did do a, a section about Chuck, yes. Uh, so that's, uh, I think he's the first person I, I discussed was Chuck. So um, if it's recorded, you'll be able to, to see that later. Uh, by the way, this is a picture of uh, Brian Teal and, and John Wyland on the Nazina River, a trip they took organized with Dr. Embeck. Um, Matt? I have a question in the chat. When did the Alpine American Alpine Club stop meeting in Valdez? When did the American Alpine Club stop? Um, well, a Andy was the chapter president for Alaska, for the Alaska <laughs> section of the American Alpine Club. I'm I, I'm not sure when, from from what date to what year, from what year to what year Andy Andy was the president. Uh, somebody, you know, somebody obviously on there probably knows the exact exact timing of that. But um, I know with, uh, if, if I went into my, um, let me just kind of, if it helps people, uh, the Valdez, the Vanguard files, which I have submitted to the museum, have in order articles on alpinism all the way in chronological order on all these people. Uh, I've just touched the surface with, with what, I, what I've shown you here. So if you want to do further sure. research and get more in depth on those things. Like, I, I don't know exactly what year Andy was the, um, was put into the, uh, uh, the London, the London Alpine Club, but uh, it, I, I know it's in the article that I took a picture of, but I'm not sure what year it was. Yeah, there was, there was kind of, uh, a couple alpine organizations there was uh you know they come in different names i know that there was uh one group of uh of alpine uh club up in fairbanks um i can't remember the gentleman's name that, that, that ran and they were kind of a a different group than the than, than the than the the other group of that were attached to the american alpine club so they were called the alaska alpine club or something like that um, I can't remember the gentleman's name right now. Uh, Chuck, uh, the Sandbeck House uh, up in Fairbanks was was a bastion of of, of climbers hanging out there at the Sandbeck House, and um, so yeah. So there's there 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 has been kind 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 of some back and forth. Uh, there there have been a number of organizations in Alaska as far as mountaineering. Benjamin, if you unmute yourself, you can ask Matt your question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the talk, Matt. Um, I was curious if you knew much about summer rock climbing around Valdez on the big, big mountains, if there's ever been a phase of that. Um, you know, the rock, the rock in Valdez is pretty bad. And uh, so, so it doesn't get a whole lot of attention. But um, <laughs> I know like out the rock quarry was a place where where Chuck and uh, Brian spent a lot of time out there and people the rock climbers would go out there and, and and hang out out there and I don't know if it's in the same shape it was then um, but uh, you know Valdez rock is not very good rock and there's not it's just not much granite around here all those all that type of rock but as technology has has improved uh, these these impediments have, have been overcome. And, and now people are, uh, for instance, peaks where we would go up and do one peak, uh, finding a, a safe route. Uh, you know, we're seeing connector peaks along, along jagged ridges and connecting peaks and doing longer, more technical connecting along the peaks like that, which, I, which, which I'm kind of impressed with. I, I think that's a, uh, so, so people are, are navigating those the, those rock hazards of Valdez. Um, but initially, um, it just, you know, Valdez rock was just really bad, still is, <laughs> hadn't changed much. Um, I think those who have ice climbed in Keystone Canyon and done mixed ice climbing in, in, in Keystone Canyon know the, 
know know how challenging it is around here to to be on rock. Thank you. Matt Brunton, do you want to unmute yourself? He writes, there's some surprisingly good alpine rock. Taylor Brown and I've explored some tons of big adventure out there. Matt, yes. did you Matt Brunton, do you want, want to unmute yourself and chat? Oh yeah, I don't really have too much to say to it. I just tuned in. I got a reminder from Taylor that this was going on, but yeah, no, there's this past summer I went up and <clears throat> did a trip up Valdez Glacier, a few miles up a ridge to the Ramsey Rutherford historic mining area and climbed prospectors and then a couple other prominent peaks up there that I called Siltstone and Sourdough. Um, pretty good rock up there, surprisingly. Um, and then in past years before I moved here, Taylor turned me on to some good stuff up around Mount Diamond and off Thompson Pass. And I mean, there's tons 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 more out there to do um for those willing to figure it out and that have the requisite skill set to figure it out on their own without any beta because that's the issue there is no beta there is no guidebook. there is none yeah we we all just pass it along um yeah you know i noticed in valdez when I, you know i mean like we were able to climb climb mountains on steep rock and and scramble around and find patches of of good rock um you know one of the things that's more amazing in valdez is I, is that as i was leaving was the the rock and and the scraping activity of glaciers is really exposing more more uh more options and smoother rock and different rock than than like like i found the rock at the base of uh worthington glacier just amazing stuff to scramble around and 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 it would you know all sorts of capability really really nice area to, to scramble around on that's that's kind of accessible that did that wasn't around in in 1980 that was all covered in ice and so as the glaciers have withdrawn we've seen all that maybe maybe more exposed options probably yeah hey matt that i just want to say thanks a bunch for all of your uh everything you've done to promote alpinism and skiing here and then also just uh your uh, vast knowledge of everything, sharing photos and information. It's super impressive. Thanks a bunch for what you do. Yeah, like like I say, what I want to do is make sure I get all this all this out here and and that's why I developed the Vanguard files. So 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 people will have access to that. Um you're not gonna always have me. I mean I, I still maintain Thompsonpass.com, my website. And if you ever peruse through there, there's all sorts of of of, of stories that I've written about about a lot of a lot of exploration in Valdez. You just kind of go through the white room and do a word search. You can, you, you can probably find a wealth of wealth of older information there too. So, um, and I'll, I'll continue to do that. But um, I think these Vanguard files are, are are pretty critical to getting it all down and and a solid <laughs> piece of paper. Um, you know, as far as Dr. Embeck, I I know he kept really good records. He 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 was meticulous in everything he done. He did so. Um, you know, there, there's there's always a curiosity of of what his records look like, um, uh, what John Wyland might have written down, and and when and when they come forward and and share some of that that stuff. But you know, I, I, most climbers are, I meet are pretty humble. They're pretty quiet about their accomplishments. They 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 they, they keep it with their group or with themselves, and and that's that's more common than not. So. Matt, um, Jack Attack asks whether or not you're willing to share your contact information for follow-up questions. I can. Um, you, you can, can email me. It's, it's pretty simple. It's mattkinney61 at iCloud.com. Matt Kinney, all small case letters, M-A-T-T, Kinney, K-I-N-N-E-Y, 61 at iCloud.com. And... I'm going to, I put that in the chat to everyone. There is um, someone, um, C-M-E-T-R, writes something about Nick W. has done a ton of bolting at the campground, Sunnyside at Worthington, and there's now development in Minnow Creek. 
Does that person want to unmute themselves and say something? Oh, this is Hannah Matroka from Valdez. Um, I just know that Nick White's been working pretty hard and with a couple of the college students from Prince William Sound um, on cleaning and reestablishing and Taylor or Ryan would probably know a ton more than I do. Um, but I know Sunnyside is getting a lot of attention this year and last year from the college community, at least. Um, someone was talking, I think Matt was discussing climbing at the quarry. Is that the campground area? No, it's more down toward the parking area. It's kind of where that road cut is. There's kind of that, I don't know if they, it's like an old mining road went up 800 feet up the mountains. But I, I think that area all got blasted. Harris Sand and Gravel came in there, blasted it all up. And um, so I, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I included a picture of like Dock Point. I know that was a real, real fun place to hang out because it was a real nice environment for people to gather and, and rock climb at, uh, at Dock Point. And people kept extending that line all the way out, all the way out almost to the container rock if you could time it during the tide. Looking, looking for problems, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick came a little bit later. Nick, Nick kind of came into scene in the 2000 or so, and uh, started started doing his thing. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm really happy to see the college. I I follow you on Facebook, and you know I really like uh, seeing you with the outdoor program and outdoor education. Um, I, I I like seeing that. Um, yeah, it's it's good. It's good to put forth that effort. Um, yeah. Matt, it's Jeremy Rabita here. Just to say thanks for your time and effort and all of this too. It's great to see a bunch of old imagery and uh, yeah, I, I got to chuckle, man. Those gold dome helmets, wherever whoever made those, that that had to be the the item back in the day because it seems like if you were climbing, skiing. White water, you know, this kind of multi-purpose gold helmet everybody wants. Yeah, just, just, just makes me chuckle. So thanks. Yeah, yeah, it was a golden standard. Yeah, yeah, you know, Dr. Embeck, he uh, he ran a uh, kind of a kayak supply equipment. So he was kind of like this, this he ran this little deal where you could get discounts. He, could, he arranged for discounts and, and stuff like that. So so he was flooding, flooding gear into Valdez. Uh, because you know we really didn't have a outdoor sporting goods store, and so Andy, you know, I don't know if he was, you know, work working with distributors or whatever. And and Andy was very innovative. He was making his own stuff. I mean, he made he made a tent that hung off a mountain wall. I mean, so so he was he he was a tinkerer, and um, um, I, I think he was the supply chain keeping this this gear, and and part of that was. The, the gold helmet showed up and, uh, you know, <laughs> sheep, <laughs> everybody got, everybody got the gold helmet and stuff like that. And I think Brian still climbed with his uh, for quite some time. Chuck, Chuck had a, had his gold helmet and so did, a, so did a number of, a number of other people, but yeah, that was a real good brand. You know, that, that put you in Valdez for sure. Yeah, I've, I've never seen that helmet anywhere. I never saw it anywhere else, except on on the head of Alaskan. So, yeah. Does anyone else have a question for Matt? Um, I just want to say on the next, I don't have someone slated for the next Tuesday Night History Talk, and that's going to be on March 28th. If you have an idea or a person or a talk that you would like the museum to support, um, either in person or via Zoom, feel free to um, contact me um, and we would be and all likelihood happy to make that happen. So um, I, I've just typed um, my contact information in the chat. Um, thanks so much, Matt. We are so 
incredibly fortunate to really, I don't even think I know how fortunate I am to have you um, share what you know with us um, on a regular basis and to support the museum program. I cannot thank you enough for all that you do for us and just um, um, growing our knowledge of what's, what's going on historically. So um, thank you and thanks everyone for choosing to come out tonight and um, participate in this program. Really appreciate it. Hope you're yep. having a great week. Thank you, everyone. Thank support, you, Matt. Support the museum. Hit the donate button, please. Okay. <laughs> hit, hit the donut button. I don't they think did, I did have work there. Well, it's 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 called the post office box. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so anyway, thank thanks everybody for showing up there. Thank you. Good night. There's, good night, Ralph. Thanks for showing. Right. I had you. Oh. <laughs>